the um, that the Zoom stays happy. Hang on, I'm just going to share my. Got some tunes. <laughs> Sorry, so if everyone could please mute themselves and switch their cameras off. We have quite a few people joining, so we just want to be sure that it's not too heavy. So we might just give it one more minute and then we will commence. Okay, so we might begin in the spirit of time um, because we, we have an hour together and we have a lot to get through. Um, I'll just repeat once again that we encourage everybody to please, yeah, keep your cameras and your audio switched off. Um, we were really excited by sort of setting this up as a Zoom meeting as webinars can be a little bit impersonal, but we really wanted to sort of see, you know, everyone hear names, you know, beautiful sort of landing photos. So thank you um for sort of yeah being with us and um cooperating um all right so we're just going to sort of continue to let people in as they arrive but first of all my name is leah smith and i'm the programs and learning manager at the biennale of sydney before we begin i would actually like to invite you to close your eyes now you know we obviously can't see whether you're doing that or not but it's it's a nice sort of uh, invitation Please take a moment to reflect upon your environment, the things that we can see and those that we can't. The stories, histories and memories of country that are embedded in the soil that sustains us and the lifeblood of earth, water. I welcome you to open your eyes. I would like to acknowledge the many different countries we connect from today. I come to you from Wangal country and I acknowledge the traditional custodians of these lands, waters, and skies, the Wanga of the Eora Nation, and elders past, present, and emerging, as well as any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander friends here with us today. We're excited to be with you to celebrate World Rivers Day with Biennale participants Arts for the Commons and two of their collaborators, Alessandra Polizon and Daniel Mencero. Our program, Voices of Rivers, Listening to and Communicating with Our Waters, is an effort to energize the digital space and facilitate connection. So Zoom can be a side of fatigue. I think we're all well aware of that this deep into COVID, but it can also be a space of dynamic exchange and learning. Arts for the Commons embrace collectivity, collaboration, and knowledge sharing and exchange through their artist, activist, and environmental practices. Arts for the Commons is comprised of two practitioners, Rosa Gijon and Francesco Martone, but they have built a rich, engaged and meaningful network nationally and internationally through their Biennale project, which we will learn more about today. You've got technique. Sorry, all just another quick reminder to please keep your audio switched off as it, it sort of disrupts the flow. Thank you. So back to Arts for the Commons practice, I think it's really important to comment on the authentic and democratic way in which they work. It sits symbiotically with our core values at the Biennale of Sydney and particularly with reference to the 23rd exhibition, Rivers, by embracing the distribution of power, plurality in voice and depth in connection and collaboration. We're privileged to share and celebrate their practice today on World Rivers Day. So today's program will one, run for one hour and feature four key moments. First, we will experience a recitation of the Universal Declaration on the Rights of Rivers 
by Italian-born, Australian-based Alessandro Polizon. Alessandro is a senior lecturer at the Southern Cross University and is one of the founding members of the Global Alliance for the Rights of Nature and the Australian Earth Laws Alliance. Next, we'll be taken on a digital journey with Arts for the Commons, Rosa, Rosa Gijon and Francesco Martone, who work between Ecuador and Italy. Arts for the Commons is a collective exercise which provides a platform for artists and activists, exploring the connections and synergies between visual production and efforts to reclaim the commons. Our third moment will be facilitated by Ecuadorian-born and France-based composer, jazz pianist, and computer music designer, Daniel Mancero. Daniel described the process of translating data captured in watery bodies into music. And finally, we will close with an immaterial call to action with Rosa and Francesco on river rights, encouraging the transference of ideas and processes introduced in our public program back into local communities across Australia and the world. So it is my great pleasure to hand you over to Alessandra and I will very, in just a moment, commence screen share. Universal Declaration of the Rights of Rivers. Acknowledging that rivers are essential to all life by supporting a wondrous diversity of species and ecosystems, feeding wetlands and other aquatic habitats with abundant water, delivering life-giving nutrients to coastal estuaries and the oceans, carrying sediments to river deltas teeming with life and performing other essential ecological functions. Aware that rivers also play a vital role in the functioning of Earth's hydrologic cycle and that the viability of rivers to play this role depends on numerous factors, including the maintenance of surrounding river catchments, floodplains and wetlands. Recognizing the absolute dependence of people on rivers and water-based systems, which support human life by providing us with clean and bountiful water for drinking and sanitation, fertile soil, food sources to billions of people, recreation, cultural uses, and nourishment of the human spirit, as they have done since the beginning of human civilization. alarmed that humans have caused the significant pollution of rivers worldwide, including with organic matter from wastewater and sewage, plastic waste, pathogens and nutrients from agriculture and contaminants from industry, in addition to many other forms and sources of pollution, with resulting declines in aquatic health and biodiversity as well as extensive negative human health impacts. Concerned that excessive waterway diversions and groundwater withdrawals have significantly reduced flows in rivers worldwide, with many waterways now running completely dry. Despite scientific consensus that adequate flows are fundamental to the survival of river ecosystems and serve as the lifeblood of many river-dependent freshwater and riparian ecosystems. Further, concerned that humans have caused wide-scale physical changes to rivers through dams and other infrastructure, which includes the construction of over 57,000 large dams worldwide that impact over two thirds of all rivers, resulting in fragmented habitats, reduced biodiversity, imperiled fish populations, exacerbated climate change and retained sediment and nutrients that are fundamental to downstream ecosystem health. Finding 
that national and international laws pertaining to waterways are vastly inadequate to protect the integral health of rivers and river basins alike, and that these laws also fail to ensure current and future generations of humans and other species, as well as ecosystems with adequate supplies of clean water to meet their basic needs. Aware that all people, including indigenous communities and other local communities of all spiritual faiths, have long held through their traditions, religions, customs, and laws, that nature, often called Mother Earth, is a rights-bearing entity, and that rivers in particular are sacred, entities possessing their own fundamental rights. Cognizance that the degradation and exploitation of rivers is not only an environmental issue, but also a rights concern for indigenous peoples and other local communities. As the destruction of rivers threatens the very existence and way of life of those who rely upon river systems for their well being. Guided by the growing number of governments worldwide that seek to reverse the ongoing trends of global environmental degradation by recognizing and enforcing nature's inherent rights, including through a constitutional amendment in Ecuador, two national laws in the plurinational state of Bolivia, a new constitution of Mexico City, and dozens of right of nature ordinances in the United States. Further, guided by the growing legal recognition of the inherent rights of rivers, including through a New Zealand treaty recognizing the Wanganui River, or Te Awa Tupua, as an indivisible and living whole and a legal person with appointed guardians to represent the river's interests. A Uttarakhand High Court decision declaring the Ganga or Ganges and Yamuna rivers as having the status of a legal person in order to preserve and conserve them. A Colombia Constitutional Court decision ruling that the Atrato River Basin possesses rights to protection, conservation, maintenance and restoration and a right to be free from pollution and destruction and an Ecuadorian provincial court ruling enforcing the constitutional rights of the Vilcabamba River in calling for its remediation and rehabilitation. Convinced that recognizing the rights of nature and in particular recognizing those river rights contained in this declaration will foster the creation of a new legal and social paradigm based on living in harmony with nature and respecting both the rights of nature and human rights, particularly with reference to the urgent needs of indigenous communities and the ecosystems they have long protected. Morning the many rivers across the globe that have already died due to human activities, including those so over diverted as to no longer flow. Those enclosed within pipes and buried under layers of concrete and those so polluted as to no longer sustain life. Henceforth, this document declares that all rivers are entitled to the fundamental rights set forth in this declaration, which arise from the very existence on our shared planet. Further, declares that all rivers are living entities that possess legal standing in a court of law. establishes that all rivers shall possess, at minimum, the following fundamental rights. First, 
the right to flow. Second, the right to perform essential functions within its ecosystem. Third, the right to be free from pollution. Fourth, the right to feed and be fed by sustainable aquifers. Fifth, the right to native biodiversity. And sixth, the right to regeneration and restoration. Further, establishes that these rights are intended not only to ensure the health of rivers, but also the health of watersheds and river basins of which rivers are a part, as well as the health of all ecosystems and natural beings therein, all of which possess, at minimum, the fundamental rights to exist, thrive, and evolve. Maintains that in order to ensure full implementation and enforcement of these rights, each river shall be entitled to the independent appointment of one or more legal guardians that act solely on behalf of the river's rights and who may represent the river in any legal proceeding or before any governmental body empowered to affect it, with at least one legal guardian being an indigenous representative for those rivers upon which indigenous communities traditionally depend. Determines that rivers shall have their best interests, as determined by their legal guardians, assessed and taken into account by both government and private entities in all actions or decisions that concern such rivers. Resolves that all states shall implement those rights in full within a reasonable amount of time, including by developing and acting upon an integrated assessment of watershed health, according to the most recent scientific understandings and in partnership with all stakeholders. Strongly urges all governments to ensure prompt and adequate financial mechanisms to realize these fundamental river rights, including the rights of all rivers to restoration. And finally asserts that governments shall consider for decommission all dams that lack a compelling social and ecological purpose, and that new dam construction shall only occur when necessary to achieve a compelling social and ecological purpose that cannot be met by other reasonable means. And that in such case, dam construction shall only occur upon securing the full, free, prior, and informed consent of indigenous and other impacted communities, including marginalized communities. And by using the best available technologies by which to preserve ecosystem health.
Thank you, Alessandro. What a beautiful introduction. It was so meditative and so poetic to sort of listen to you talk with and to and communicate with the river. It was amazing. Um, it's my great pleasure now to hand over to artists Rosa and Francesco from Arts for the Commons. Um, just to sort of also mention that we would love for you guys to be engaging with us through the chat. So our team at the Biennale are um, monitoring that. So please send through any questions that you may have and we'll do our best to answer them throughout the session. Over to the artists. Hello, everybody. Greetings from Vienna. Uh, we are very pleased to be able to uh, have everybody here in this amazing event and uh, also to share a little bit with you what our project is being uh, built for the Sydney Biennale. What you will be seeing today is a first part of a, a very consistent part and a first part of our project which is um, uh, based upon a translation that we wanted to, to make on giving the voices of rivers a face and the sound and bringing it so far away from our home countries, Ecuador and Italy to uh, Sydney. Um, what you will be seeing today, and I'm going to start sharing my screen, is something that we decided to call a digital platform. This platform um, is intended to do <clears throat> the part of a container and the, the house to be able to share efforts and the work behind the idea of the rights of rivers and recognizing the rights of rivers around the world. And this is also an opportunity for us to share this uh, work in the very special day as today, the World's Rivers Day. So um, our page is called Voices of Rivers because we decided that that would be an interesting uh, name to go around the world with this idea. As you can see, this is, a, this is a digital platform that has a few um, parts on it. And I will start by talking a bit about the project. Vilcabamba de Iuris Fluminis et Terre, as um, Leah was saying, is a collaborative arts project to bring the voices of rivers to the 23rd Sydney Biennale. We wanted to um, be able to share this idea of how to bring uh, the voices of rivers to a wider public, not only in Sydney, but worldwide. And so we decided to start by um, thinking which one is the first river that has been recognized with person with uh, legal personhood in, in, in Ecuador, my home country, and it's the Vilcabamba River in the south part of the country. But this name is also very important because it comes from a name uh, in Quechua from the um, Inca Empire, the Tawantinsuyo, and it has been named as a sacred place in many of the records by people like Waman Poma, Yayala, and the Chronicles of the Colony. So the idea was to um, map what are the rivers in, around the world who have been recognized person, uh, legal personhood and uh, other um, uh, projects and uh, territories whose um, rights have been recognized. We wanted to find a way to um, find a, like an identity. So we decided to um, map them by um, taking the GPS coordinates of all these rivers. So that took us to the point that we have some um, hard data numbers and how and what we wanted to um, go beyond that and go beyond recording only the sound of the rivers 
and translate that identity, that universal identity that everybody uh, knows, you know, the GPS sounds, and translate them into sounds and then translate them further into music. We are not musicians. We are not mathematicians. We are not composers. So we started this um, adventure by um, involving people that could do this for us and that could accept the challenge of translating this hard data into sound and into music. Um, the project is composed by three, or the, the piece at the end of this project is composed by three um, parts. Uh, a first movement, the Te Agua Tupoa. The second one is an intermezzo called Cuencas Sagradas. And the third one is Pachamama. Pachamama, as you know, in Quichua is the name of Mother Earth for our uh, ancestral you know, communities. So that is what, what, we, what we've been working on. And you can find in this site some, some of the details of what we're doing. But this is not uh, something that we came up with. The rights of rivers and the rights of nature is something that has been already been worked by a lot of people. And uh, we are very glad to be able to work with all those people who have, have been thinking and have been collaborating and have been struggling and have been uh, working very deeply on the, on the contents of how to uh, recognize the rights of Mother Earth and of course the rights of rivers. Um, among them, as you can see from the who we are. So the rights of Mother Earth are something that you can find in this page. You now the rights of nature. And what are the things that have been built before that? What are the universal declarations of the rights of rivers? Who is the global alliance on the rights of nature? What are the tribunals of the rights of nature? And this is, you know, the page where you can find all that information and also some of the pictures of these tribunals that have been going on in different parts of the world. So this is, as Rosa was saying, this is a collaborative effort. We think when we talk about arts for the commons, we don't only refer to the issue we deal with, the commons, but also how to create commoning how to build a platform or offer a platform that is collaborative and is open and free to access for who, those that feel you know, close to the purpose we are, we are trying to pursue. So as Rosa was saying, this, this, this effort is an effort that brings together individuals, organizations, movements, networks that are active, that have been active, but that will be active on the rights of rivers and the rights of nature. Let me just uh, mention them. Iniciativa de Cuenca Sagrada is a binational initiative uh, run by, um, by indigenous organizations and support organizations to protect a sacred watershed of the Peruvian and Ecuadorian Amazon and bringing in not only an effort to resist the impact of extractive activities, but also to propose um, our management systems that are based on traditional livelihoods and traditional knowledge systems. The Global Alliance on the Rights of Nature is a global collective of academics and activists that is working to advance the so-called Earth jurisprudence by developing analysis and by supporting struggles for the recognition of the rights of nature. International Rivers is a California-based NGO but it basically has an international scope and reach in its activities and has been working together with communities worldwide in the last decades to support them and to support their efforts to stop the impact, to prevent the impact of destructive projects and to reclaim the water commons. The International Rights of Nature Tribunal, whom I'm also a proud member of, is an international tribunal that was established in the Cochabamba Summit on the Rights of Nature in Bolivia and that is actually holding frequent sessions, uh, analyzing cases brought about uh, on behalf of ecosystems that are endangered. The last one I would like to recall, the European session 
was also dealing with the Balkan rivers. The water grabbing observatory is our Italian anchor. It's an Italian NGO initiative that is based, that works on supporting you know, uh, struggles for the recognition of water rights in Italy and in Europe, and to also support the role of water defenders. And Water Justice, Justicia Hidrica, is a global network with a strong presence in Latin America that uh, basically works for, uh, for water justice and communities. Let me also recall the individuals that are collaborating, that have been collaborating with us. Uh, the first one, in, indeed, Alessandro and the Australian Hub. It's a group of artists and Aboriginal activists and uh, practitioners and academics, not only from Australia, but also from New Zealand, that have been extremely open and very collaborative and very, um, let's say, um, proactively engaged also in helping us in further developing the concept and the idea. Then I would like to personally acknowledge Alberto Costa, economist of Ecuador and former uh, chair president of the Ecuadorian Constitutional Assembly, that one that recognized and enshrined the rights of nature in the Ecuadorian Constitution. Natalie Green and the old staff of the Global Alliance on the Rights of Nature. Belen Paez of Fundacion Pachamama for the Iniciativa Cuenca Sagrada. Manari Shugasanti, a leader and spiritual leader of the Sapa Nation in Ecuador. Uh, Giuseppe Carlone and the staff of Zoar that have been volunteering to build this beautiful landing page. Nicolas Guzman, a scholar and researcher on music and mathematics in, in, in the United States. Ecuadorian artist Maria Gabriela Punin, that is based in Vilcabamba, that will be helping us also in the whole uh, groundwork. In, in November. Uh, Italian filmmaker Francesco Cabras for his very insightful uh, suggestions and advice in how to structure this work. And Australia, Austrian artist Oliver Ressler that has been inviting us to this residence in the Q21 in Austria, in Vienna, that helped us to further develop the concept and the project, but also share it with, uh, with, uh, with a broader public here in Vienna within a beautiful exhibition on of course, title Overground Resistance that maps the, the, the activities of artists engaged in the climate justice movements. And the Monte Aguirre, Bonnie Barclay, the International Rivers, and all the stuff of International Rivers. We think that this is just the beginning of a, of a, of a platform that we would like to further consolidate and, and, and strengthen from now on. And the one thing that we also would like to share is our uh, conviction that beyond celebrating the, the, the day of the rivers today, we also have to honor the communities that are protecting them, the land defenders, indigenous women, the Aboriginal communities in Australia that are struggling to protect their sacred rivers for their role, for their work, for their commitment, for those that lost their lives that were killed or that are criminalized for their efforts and their commitment to protect the rivers worldwide. Um, Voices at the Biennale is also something at the Biennale of Sydney has also something to do with a critical way of looking at geography, how to map differently in not only with sound, but also by going into those territories and going to uh, pick up the, the idea of those rivers uh, with personal, uh, with the legal personhood. Um, by doing so, we are using the instruments of um, the normal and the mainstream ways of measuring the world that have been invented by um, countries that have been always the colonial part of the world. And those instruments have been used by them to um, go and identify territories when they can do extractivism or to expand the extractivism zone. So this was something that we wanted to um, use because also those same uh, instruments, the GPS and GIS coordinates are useful for the same, um, for, for, the, for the communities and the indigenous peoples and the custodians of territories to identify the ways to protect their own territories. 
I just wanted to show that in this part where we we're uh, talking about the voice of Vivianana, you can find a little bit of what Daniel Mancero is going to be talking about today. He's the musician that has accepted our challenge. And um, after uh, we had identified all this data, So you have a little bit of that. And in this part, Voices of Guardians of Mother Earth, we have included one small testimony from, from the Sapara community in Ecuador and more are going to be coming. As Francesco was saying, this is a work in progress. And uh, so um, this is not over yet. These are just the first contributions that we've been getting. And you can see, um, Manari's Kuhicha Sapara Nyanuka, Kuhicha Manari Ushiba. Yo les quiero enviar un mensaje desde el corazón de la selva, de la Amazonía. I'm inviting you to see this one, not right now, because it's going to be taking a little bit too much time. But some other people are going to send their testimonies. But uh, Manari is doing like a ceremony to welcome everybody into this, in the, into this um, platform. As Francesco was saying, um, International Rivers is one of our partners and they have been uh, so generous to uh, contribute in different ways into this website and this uh, platform. This is the gallery of all the rivers whose personhood has been recognized and you can go through those amazing uh, images and then see where they, um, you know, uh, who are the communities that have been uh, able to fight and struggle and also um, achieve uh, amazing results in, in defending rivers. But they have also been amazing in letting us host this map. This map uh, needs a little bit of introduction. Uh, because one of the ideas behind our project is that of practicing critical geography. As uh, Rosa was saying, we are trying to use current geographic positioning systems that somehow are frequently used to identify zones of sacrifice for the extraction of materials and raw materials or are used to map and police migratory routes or are used also to identify targets in conflicts. We want to decolonize them and use them for a different purpose. And this helps us in creating different geographies and different ways of different cartographies, let's say dissident cartographies, like the one that Danielle has been putting together that is a sound map of rivers and ecosystems that have legal personhood or have, or have been are searching for you know, their own rights through the Tribunal on the Rights of Nature. This is a map uh, set put together by international rivers about all the different struggles for river rights in the world. Those rivers that have rights or legal personhood, those ongoing fights and struggles. So it really gives us a different view about geography and about what is the history behind uh, the, 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 the sites and spaces. We have been inspired in our work to in the very beginning by the work of a French anarchist geographer, Elisée Reclus, that wrote a beautiful book about the history of, of a water stream. And that has been a very fundamental Inish pioneer in this uh, discipline of critical and dissident geography and cartography. Whereas he was saying that, you know, by uh, unveiling and by showing the hidden stories of ecosystems is a contribution for global justice and for, for, and for their protection. We're talking about uh, a geographer that was working like more than a century ago, so real pioneer. So you can, you're going through this map, you can really see the status of the different struggles and how you know, this complements ideally and practically the sound map that Danielle will be uh, showing us and it will be uh, discussing with us today. Finally, uh, we wanted to take uh, the opportunity um, to um, try to engage a wider community, a world community if possible, into this um, open call for contributions. 
Yes, this is uh, one of the activities that we are proposing because we think arts can also be a space and an opportunity for engagement, not only of those that, that normally work and struggle for the rights of the environment or the rights of rivers, but also for everybody, for the communities and individuals that feel close to rivers, spiritually, culturally, uh, geographically. So the pro we will be uh, closing this, uh, this event with a call for action that will be going into details at the end. But let me just also remind that uh, one idea we have is also to share more broadly uh, the instruments that have been developed for this project. And this is also an, a part that we will be giving, you know, explaining you later at the end of this event. Yeah. So what we want to um, ask people, and we might repeat it later, is to take the chance to sign the Universal Declaration of the Rights of Rivers. So you can do it really, really fast. So this is the first part of what our open call is all about, because we need more people engaging and more people knowing about what the rights of rivers are. So link and try to, it's, it's very uh, easy, it's very fast. We also want people all over the world, we all have a river that we know, we all have a river that comes, uh, or, um, goes through our cities or a river that we are in love with or a river that has been uh, imported in our lives. Um, so try and do this thing, read a declaration that Alessandro just amazingly uh, wrote, uh, read. Um, and choose one of the articles and take your cell phone, um, find a river near you. If you're in lockdown, maybe you can find a picture of a river that you have at home or that you just simply love, uh, the picture that you have taken. And um, take a picture of that and then choose one of the articles and the one that relates more to your your decision, um, a cleaner river, a river without a dam, roads away from your river, uh, be able to, you know, find living uh, still in your river, you know, all the articles are very amazing. And then once you do that, um, tag them, put them on Instagram and tag them with Voices of Rivers, BOS, and voices of rivers those are the tags and more more and more tags are coming alternatively you can also do a short video of yourself of a friend of a um, someone close to you read one of the articles that you are interested in and do the same thing uh, share it on instagram we want to do a further map a map of feelings this is a more emotional map a map that has to do with people and their territories and um, help us do this uh, amazing map to all together this this is the nature of of rivers rivers are born rivers go through rivers never end and so rivers are things that go into our lives in a, in a very vivid way so this um, this is our call um, we have created a small uh, also um, Instagram page called Voices of Rivers, where you can find all the articles as well. But there is going to be a wider campaign and you will be listening from it and uh, uh, through uh, you know, the social um, network from the Biennale. Um, so let, let, let's do that, let's do this together. Engaging in this, uh, in this um, activity is being part of all the custodians and the protectors of the river. So this is our chance, a universal chance, a world chance to uh, create a further map of, uh, you know, uh, rivers that have rights. So um, I don't know if Francesco, you want to say something else? No, so I think we're, we're done with this. Thank you very much for, um, listening to us i'm going to stop sharing uh, as i told you the the website is called voicesofrivers.net visit it uh, use it uh, find about it uh, and um, that's it see you soon i hope so <laughs> amazing <laughs>
Thank you so much, Rosa and Francesco. It's um, it's always such a pleasure to hear, you know, from you both. And I think, um, you know, one of the really exciting things about public programs is really opening up that dialogue and conversation and your, you know, your working methodologies. I mean, what really excites me is how, I mean, often, you know, we talk about this idea of sustainability and um, Jose and the curatorium are often talking about, you know, um, sustainability or, or measuring impact is not as simple as, you know, don't fly in artists overseas because you need to be mindful of that ecological footprint, but it's also about what value that the relocation of that artist to a new environment brings to that local community. But you've been able to build such a, a rich network of collaborators nationally and locally, um, you know, particularly too within this COVID context and to really hand over that agency to your collaborators here, which is such a um, generous and empowering um, offering. But now you have built this digital portal that not only then celebrates all of these incredible partnerships with your environmental, you know, and activist um, you know, experiences and networks, but then sort of more broadly sharing that out to audiences and thinking of all of these other alternative ways of counter mapping. It's just like, like it just keeps expanding and, and, and blowing up. And it's, it's so nice that we have this conversation to kind of share more broadly and to talk to some of those processes because it's, it's a really beautiful and generous model of, of working. Um, I'm mindful of time, so we're going to quickly jump over to Danielle now, um, the wonderful composer that has been collaborating with Rosa and Francesco, and he's going to talk to the process of translating this data into sound and music. Thank you, Danielle. Thank you very much. Well, I'm very pleased to be here today with you, and uh, I'm really honoured to be part of this amazing project with a beautiful team of people and artists and activists. It's, uh, I'm really honored and I, I thank all of, all of you. Uh, I think that in the framework of this uh, project uh, involving the creation of a music that could represent the river, we have to take into account, I think, two kinds of interpretations. So uh, first of all, we have to devise the sound of the river as an acoustic ecosystem in order for us to target data that will be consistent with what the river wants to tell us and the reality, the acoustic reality of the river. So I, can, I would like to say it's kind of like a scientific approach in order for us to be uh, precise with the information that we will be managing. And secondly, um, we have to render a musical product that will be considered as such as a music and not only a collection of raw data. So as you can see, the, the, uh, there's a lot of, 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 thing, of things that have to be put together in order to, uh, to make this project. So I would like to start by asking a, a question in order for me to address the matter adequately. And the question is this one, is there any need of a composer really in order for us as humans to acknowledge nature sounds as a music? According to acoustic ecology principles, a correct listening strategy will suffice for enabling a musical and therefore aesthetic experience while listening to nature. In other words, according to those same principles, we are all composers in that it is uh, the listening strategy that we, we, we adopt that will enable us to perceive music in nature or nature as a music. Nevertheless, uh, as a composer and musical performer, it is hard for me to say that an outright field recording diffusion would be enough for us as humans to listen to the inner music of, for instance, the Vilcabamba River, less still enough for trying to communicate with it. And if I say this, is because there is a whole scenario and a whole imagery around what natural soundscapes and landscapes mean to us. And that involves not only our capacity of listening, but also our need to imagine and to communicate in a aesthetic way. So when the idea of musicalizing the Vilcabamba River was given to me by Rosa Francesco and the, this beautiful team, I immediately thought about how to link our innate mechanisms of perception if you like, from a scientific point of view, and the imagery that permits us to experience music as an expressive narrative. 
So it's uh, from an artistic point of view. So I will try to explain the, the, the proceeding, the, the, the process of, of musical composition and research. First, the, the river view, uh, viewed as a physical water body produces a unique sound type that we can identify as its voice. The acoustic parameters that describe its particular timbre or its sound quality will shape a specific topography of sound and therefore it will permit the estimation of acoustic variables for musical writing. So we can take the river as, a, as an entity, as an acoustic voice, in order for us to analyze its qualities and describe uh, the different shapes and uh, topography that, that compose this sound, in order for us to infer some what I like to call hidden musical structures. And given the fact that our idea of musical sounds in nature responds to a complex set of perceptual variables that govern cognitive processes, I took this, I took timbre as the start point for devising the sounds of the river. So the mode of perception enables us, uh, enables or disables the possibility to transition between attentional strategies as well as to shift focus between different aspects of the sonic experience. This means that if we experience the river as a music or as a soundscape, we can we can switch our attention and we can perceive it as uh, as a diachronic composition. Uh, I mean, we can pick, we can pick some pitches, some. Uh, uh, saliences that will be perceived as pitches, as notes, and then we can compose in, in our head a, a melody. That's what I call a melodic entity. But also, we can think of its organization as a, a single point that will be constructing and uh, that will be characterizing its timbre. That's what I like to call harmonic entities. So in order to tackle both cognitive mechanisms and musical representation of things in ecological terms, I think we need to, th to link the referential and the abstract. From that perspective, the elements of a soundscape should be interpreted as a potential acoustic resource for musical composition. And if and only if their association is consistent with the equilibrium of the acoustic environment. So what I I'm trying to say is that in order for me to, to, to tackle this project, this, this, uh, this challenge, I, I, I know that I knew that I, I couldn't just pick some notes uh, from a, a, a analysis and then take those notes in order for me to create a melody, for instance. I think that the ecological way of thinking regards this whole process of perception and immersion. So I think we have these two layers, the diachronic way of experiencing the river and also the synchronic way of, of living it. So um, I built a software capable of delivering targeted description in a diachronic and synchronic perspective. So I would like to show you a little demo. This is the first one of those softwares. Uh, and as you may see here, we can load an audio file so the river with its soundscape then we will choose some uh, acoustic parameters in order for us to impose a threshold of analysis which uh, which will permit us to uh, browse the audio file by stepping uh, into each one of the uh, the articulation points that the analysis will give us and as you may see each one of those points could be interpreted as a frequency as a pitch uh, for that, I just take each one of those uh, of those points in space time, and I uh, impose a, a transform, an FFT transform. So the whole energy of the the sound, the sounding energy, will be mapped uh, in the into the um, the frequency domain. Secondly, for the synchronic part of the uh, of the analysis. We proceed uh, in, in the same fashion. So we take the audio file 
and we trigger the analysis. But as you can see, the difference here is that when we impose a threshold and we proceed with the analysis, we, will, we won't find just one pitch, but a collection of frequencies that would determine the, uh, the timber quality of the sound. So here we have the collection. We have to impose a second threshold in order for us to know which of those frequencies is more salient than, than the other. And that's the way that we can uh, we can map we can browse the uh, the river as a uh, as an acoustic ecosystem. So here I show you, for instance, three different collections. So that's um, that's the first part. That's the the scientific and research uh, behind this beautiful project and the challenge. And after synthesizing the melodic and harmonic structures that characterize the uh, the river and its timber. I followed a system of constrained writing according to which the only notes to be included must originate from this frequency domain analysis. So I, I, I really forced me to not um, take notes that I would love uh, to be there, nor to erase the, uh, some notes or pitches that I didn't like. And I really tried to respect and to, uh, to uh, to keep the, the whole logic of this uh, acoustic system into the composition. So this system of constrained writing, uh, it's represented here by a small uh, piece of, of, of the process in which each collection passes through the, the musical writing and the, uh, the process of orchestration for the piano. Also, I created a patch for rousing the acoustic space in accordance with the GPS with the global positioning system that will ident identify the locations through which the river passes. And this mainly relates to uh, the global idea of the artwork and uh, what we just could, uh, could uh, listen to uh, a minute ago. So the idea is that when we take this uh, acoustic space, we can map it, but not randomly. We will, we will take the GPS coordinates in order for us to, to be guided inside this, uh, this, uh, this space, this acoustic space. So this is the, the small patch and I can show you a small video. So as you can see, we have a small collection of notes, but we cannot take them randomly. We will follow the path that the GPS coordinates gives us. And finally, what I tried to do was to weave a link between melodic and harmonic data in an instrumental composition context in a, in a certain ecological thinking. So the idea of respecting the river as, a, as an entity, as, as something that really has, has a life in it, has a, an acoustic reality, is, uh, is approached in that manner. The compositional process has been undertaken in compliance with this aesthetic wish to pay heed to the harmonic system deriving from this analysis. All the modes so each group of notes originates from a specific moment of the analysis. So finally, the, the music has been created, has been written in order. So the river starts and I take only the, the, the moments of this starting point, uh, this mental starting point. And this will create the first part of the music and so on. We will try to create a narrative musical thing by respecting this whole uh, environment. So finally, the music. <laughs> I invite you to listen to some excerpts of, uh, of this beautiful project. <laughs> this is the first part, which uh, I would like to call uh, immersion of the immersive part. And uh, as Rosa told us uh, earlier, Wilco is the, 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 the Quechua term, the Quechua term for, for the, uh, the whole imaginary, imagery, sorry, uh, of the, this environment, the, the, the sacred valley that contains the, the trees. And Wilco is one of those words that means a tree. So here you go. Thank you. 
just a little excerpt of the first part. And finally, the second part, the intermezzo. Here we go. Thank you very much. Sorry. So you can stop your share. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you so much, Daniel. Um, so I'm mindful of time. We've just hit 7 p.m. and we will have two final calls to action. So one will come from uh, Rosa and Francesco. The other is to mention that today is sort of the launch of Rosa and Francesco's website, um, their landing page that you've just sort of had this beautiful insight um, into. Um, however, to actually, you know, fully experience the, the complexity of this work, um, Rosa and Francesco will also be exhibiting next year as part of the exhibition. So please come and, and have that, you know, as Daniel said, a very immersive experience with their work, which will really sort of, I think, um, you know, really uh, add an extra layer of understanding through sort of being on this journey with us today and then having the the opportunity to go in and be physically in the space with the work and with the music. So over to Francesco and Rosa for, for final words. Thank you. Yes, um, a very quick uh, word about how also we mean uh, this music. Uh, the plan and thanks also to Danielle's uh, openness and availability is to put the score on the web as Creative Commons so that everybody that wants to use it as an instrument of performance or of activism in the rivers to, to, to play it as a, as, a, as, a, as a way of joining the struggle for the rights of rivers worldwide can, you, can do it. So we don't see this as a process that closes with the Biennale duration, but it's an offer and a contribution to the global struggles worldwide. And this is also the, the sense of uh, embedding the rights of river declaration and the call to action in our landing page. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for being here and for this amazing journey together. Uh, again, uh, let's make this happen. Let's make this map, this uh, collective map of, of your rivers, not you know some river, your rivers, the ones that you love, and take time to find the rights of rivers the Universal Declaration and take time also to take pictures and send them and tag them and be part of this amazing thing. This is, this is all of us. Thank you very much. Wonderful. So thank you so much, Rosa. Thank you, Francesco. Thank you, Danielle. Thank you, Alessandro. And of course, thank you to all of our wonderful attendees today. Um, it's been so beautiful to, to share space together. And, you know, the, the chat has been incredibly lively. Um, my colleagues have, have mentioned that we have recorded today's session and it will be available on the Biennale of Sydney YouTube. Um, so please, yeah, stay tuned, please share. And of course, you know, if you want to re-listen to, to any of the segments, it, it'll be there and, and openly available in the spirit of, you know, this common practice where, where information is shared and, um, you know, generously accessible to all. So thank you and enjoy the rest of your night. See you guys later. Everybody. <laughs> Bye. Bye.